Hi everyone, it's Natalie here and um, I'm here to announce my channel name change. So um, for a long time I was just Nat TJ because I didn't know for years, I mean I've been on YouTube for years and really never had a channel and I didn't necessarily want to use my full name um, but I also didn't feel a need to hide anything necessarily. Um, so I just kind of went with a variation of my name. Um, close friends and family call me Nat. Um, sometimes students have referred to me as Nat, and a lot of people have just referred to me over over the years just as NTJ um, because my full name is Natalie Turner Jones. So it just felt like an easy thing to do. And as time has moved on and I did finally, <laughs> for better or worse, um, decide to start a YouTube channel. Um, yeah, I I realized like, yeah, maybe having a name, you know, for that channel is a good idea. It's taken some, some time and some contemplation uh, to decide that. And as I was thinking, you know, do I want to stay with a, a name that I've used online a lot, which is um, Zen Urban Coyote. Uh, and that felt right for years. That has been a really, you know, that was the name of my blog. And um, I used it for a lot of things. A lot, you know, a lot of online accounts have still have that name. So some of you are already friends with me on Instagram. Um, I started a new account with Sanskrit Blue on it instead of um, Zen Urban Coyote, but that account still exists. I think I'll probably continue to use um, Zen Urban Coyote. But the contemplation is so interesting because it's about identity. And it's about like, what am I, you know, what am I responding to in the creation of those names and where are they coming from? Um, and I kind of thought I would just offer that, like where, you know, where that started and where it came from. So back in 2011, um, I, I started a blog and it's long since defunct. I mean, it, it, I don't know that it even exists anywhere except in when I go to my WordPress. <laughs> it's like, oh, do you remember you started this one little blog um, that was about Zen practice and learning like what I was learning from my dog and my cat and their relationship and I was very new um, to formal Zen practice I mean I'd been reading about Zen since I was a kid um, well I don't know 14 15 and it wasn't like it was a foreign idea let's say and yeah, I don't know. I, I had started that blog. Nobody read it. It was just what I wanted to do for myself. It was, you know, a matter of self-care and just integrating a lot of um, really challenging experiences that I'd had in 2010 and 2011. Um, and then I, I came up with other names because I started to think I want to change the name of my blog and the direction of it. Um, and kind of broaden it and expand it. And that was also the time during which I became um, <clears throat> something other than just a theater practitioner. So I had spent years practicing theater and yoga and um, movement and <clears throat> basically, you know, anything that was associated with <sighs> anything that was associated with theater, um, you know, or just sort of general spirituality, um, mediumship, tarot. I had I had run the gamut with with all of that exploration, but I'd never looked into art aside from theater. Um, and I would say that while my spiritual practice helped keep me afloat, that's kind of, it was, and I did grow. I was growing from it. I wouldn't say that at that point it had really done anything transformative yet. And by around 2010, my whole life changed. <clears throat> like everything about it, everything about the way I viewed 
life and everything about the way I viewed, I guess myself maybe, um, began to transform at that point. And, um, it was, it was really significant, actually. It was really, really significant. Um, and it was really the point at which I'd been away, I'd been away from the tarot for probably three years, three or four years. And I started in retrospect, I didn't know this at the time. I really was on that path, you know, that the archetypal journey of the fool um, and going through and, and even then repeating <laughs> different aspects of, um, of each of those archetypes and what they stand for and what they mean and what that is. And a lot of that it was a lot. It was a lot. Um, and something that started to happen was, was the need to, to shift focus in life, to shift my practice. And I realized I couldn't be a solo meditator anymore. I had started um, meditating in 2008 um, as a Vedic meditator. Um, and the Rig Veda is what it was based in. And of course the Rig Veda is written in the Sanskrit language. And what I'd started to learn by 2008, as I was uh, really spending more time um, examining Buddhism, because I, I couldn't sit and meditate by myself anymore. It was just, um, too much. It was too much. It really was starting, it was starting to transform me by that point. And uh, doing it alone was just not, it wasn't an option anymore. I needed to be with other people who held that same intention um, and, and were also practicing. Um, I'm so sorry. I'm so itchy all of a sudden. I'm probably just nervous <laughs> because I'm talking about stuff that's important to me. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so back to the blog. So as I was looking at, you know, I was looking at Zen and I was part of a Zen community. I think by that point I had finally uh, found you know, a Zen temple in Chicago that felt right. And by that point, Buddhism also had felt, had begun to feel right. I think that really began to happen for me in 2009, but I didn't, I was too nervous to take the steps uh, to move forward with it on my own, um, really until 2011, when I realized I couldn't just study and read and practice and do it alone anymore. Um... So I joined that Sangha and realized that the majority of the practice that, that I was studying was also rooted in Sanskrit. And so much of the yoga um, that I'd studied and a lot of the yoga texts that I'd studied you know, um, all came back to the Sanskrit language and the idea that sound and the sounds that form language are where are 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 what holds the truth they're what holds this this um almost seed like truth and anyone who's ever done um transcendental meditation or vedic meditation and my Vedic, my Vedic meditation teacher used to joke that, you know, Vedic meditation is basically TM, but without the, the TM, without the trademark, um, they operate through being, you're, you're given a bija mantra, which, um, which is just a sound. And that sound um, holds, and I found over the years, um, and certainly was experiencing by that time, um, you know, a seed holds this tremendous um, 
capacity to unfold and for something to grow out of it. And what, what was, you know, it was a sound, a, the simplicity of a sound that was allowing something in me to grow up and to unfold. Um, and that unfolding and that sound and the impact it had on my whole system um, was earth shattering. It was huge. Um, and all of it came back to Sanskrit. So to give you an idea into the Sanskrit language and the power that it holds. Um, so to give you an idea, like the, the, the most obvious uh, bija or seed mantra that everyone knows is om and when you look at the complexity of that sound and the way that that vowel is shaped and kind of grows into something that closes towards the front of the mouth you can begin at that point um, to understand the level of depth that it actually holds um, and the only way you can really know this is through extended time spent practicing with it, um, being with it, listening to it. So over a longer period of time of being with a particular sound, you know, with a particular um, bija mantra, which is, is a... It is just a sound. It is, it's got consonants. Um, and interestingly, mine has more consonants than vowel, you know, predominance to it. But um, that sound repeated, you know, through your, through your meditation, um, it takes on a life of its own. And it begins to shift everything in you it's hard to, it's not an easy thing to explain and it's not really an easy thing to put words to. Um, suffice it to say that after probably two full years of practice with it, um, something in me started to really shift and, and really uh, open up and change, like not even shift. It was something, uh, certain things began to open up and become alive while other things were clearly dying <laughs> um, and being um, dismantled, taken apart, um, it was it was a it was a really profound time and an and experience and one of the things that arose out of that was a need to create um, and not not have anything to you know in a way that was very introspective kind of like um, you know theater is not really that introspective it involves introspection I mean I guess the the um, the practice of acting is not especially introspective. It's a great way to um, dance around, you know, the structure of the ego um, without any, I'm getting way off track here, but anyway, it was not, it was not, let's just say it, it was not providing me with the level of introspective artistic um, um, outlet that I was clearly needing at that time um, as a result of the practice. And so I began to create just with what I felt I could do. And at that time I knew how to make, um, I don't think I have, oh, I have some here, but like I began to just do things like make, you know, things with beads, you know, with gemstone beads, um, really simple stuff like this at first. And then eventually, you know, it evolved into making earrings. Oh, I have, these are ones I made. So then, you know, making earrings, wire wrapping, making necklaces, um, you know, learning how to work with materials and design. And um, it was really very satisfactory because then I also had something I could offer people. I could give them as gifts and so on. And 
Then I went on a retreat, finally, for the first time in 2011, and came away from that needing to stitch, um, because I'd learned, I'd done so much with sewing machines and hand stitching as part of work practice, which is very, very much a part of your practice if you do Zen. It, it's taking, you know, it's spending a lot of time sitting, counting your breath, um, and then getting up and going, doing other things, um, carrying that practice into, you know, the activities of daily life. So eating, working, um, you know, going to the bathroom, um, you know, whatever it is, and and integrating it fully into the way that you are. And so, as I began to do more and more of that and see the links, um, the, you know, in all sorts of things that came back to the truth of sound or the truth of things that are rooted um, in 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 simplicity. You know, in something that looks simple, but is extremely complex. Um, the more I, I thought, if I'm going <laughs> to... I thought a lot of things, obviously, but... <laughs> but I, I realized, like, okay, if I'm going to come back to talking about, you know, or writing about things on a blog... Um, you know, I, writing about dogs, I think, I, I think the first one was Zen cat dog or Zen dog cat or Zen cat dog. I think it was what it was. I, nobody read it and it's not out anymore. I like took all of them down. Um, but they're, they were just so personal and there was just not, not something I wanted to share in that format. Um, but yeah, that's when the name came to me when when the name Sanskrit Blue came to me. And then I never did anything with it. It just sat there um, because I needed to spend more time actually creating and I needed to spend more time working on my art practice and really just getting to know, you know, getting to know the art practice, getting to know um, what materials, you know, to work with, how to take a vision that I have that's that's really visceral and then uh, turn that into something, you know, actual. Um, or even, you know, it took me a long time even just to get to the point where I wasn't feeling perpetually overwhelmed by artistic impulse, you know, constant, constant stream of artistic impulse, which may sound delightful, you know, if you're someone who who wants to create and, and doesn't know where to start, or if you're someone who's creative and, and artistic and um, good ideas seem like they, they just don't stick around um, long enough or, or it's hard to find them. But I can tell you, like, it was really... It was overwhelming. It was too much. Um, it, it was hard to know what to do with myself... Um, and how to how to spend um, how to spend my time how to um, it was it was just a lot it was a lot it felt like a responsibility and it didn't always feel like it was coming from me uh, and I frequently felt like I was being you know sort of given ideas that were way bigger than I had the skills to encompass if that makes any sense like. Um, like being given, you know, I don't know what the, you know, what a, what an equivalent would be. Um, I'm trying to think like a great, a great work of art. You know, if you're, if you're given, you know, um, the winged victory statue as, as like something that wants to be channeled through you, but you have never sculpted before and you've never, um, you know, you've, you have no idea what the materials are like. You've never even drawn something. You know, sculptors go through such a lengthy process to get to the point where they can actually begin to chisel something um, out of marble or stone. Um, you know, it would be like that. And and I, it was really, uh, it was a lot to, to handle. It was a lot to be with. But it did result in this unfolding, like it was a compulsion for a long time. Um, 
to figure out how, you know, how to realize it, how to, and I'm, I wouldn't even say I'm even close to that. I'm just better at managing it and better at recognizing when I have to let go of stuff or when I, you know, how to filter some of that. Like maybe this is not the impulse I need to follow. Um, yeah, it was just, it was a lot. It was, it would be like having, um, you know, I'm trying to remember if there's like a time in, in internet history, I'm sure there was that I'm just not thinking of like where you had no ability to like filter suggestions, <laughs> you know, where there's like no ability to filter suggestions, but yet every suggestion that comes along, no matter how good or, um, you know, beneficial or, or unhelpful it is, like they all come through, uh, and, and there's no way to like filter that and figure out like what's going to really help me and what's not really worth spending my time on. And it was kind of like that for a long time as well. Um, and that's all, that's all gotten easier. You know, the, the process of continuing to meditate and continuing to practice really simplified that, but you know, it did unfold everything. It, it changed. So my, I changed everything about me changed. Um, the need to create theater changed. Um, it went from something that, you know, I had to do to something that I didn't really care about, like in the sense that I wasn't attached to it. You know, if I was creating theater, great. Um, I have the skills for that. I can do that. Um, you know, I really well practiced skills to be able to do that, but I, I didn't feel the compulsion to do it. It wasn't something, you know, it was no longer the dominant impulse, I guess. It was no longer the dominant um, um, artistic impulse. So writing, of course, was, was up there. Writing has always been something that I've done. Um, and, yeah, I, I, the name Sanskrit Blue came to me at that point. By the time I came around to actually wanting to blog or put my artwork out there, something else had come through. Um, because I had, you know, a whole a whole other host of experiences that uh, came to fruition and, and awakened something in me. So the first expression of that was, uh, or the second, I guess, expression of that was, um, was Zen, was actually urban Zen coyote initially, because I lived in Chicago. Um, I was practicing Zen and I had a really, a uh, remarkable experience with an urban coyote um, when I was out walking my dog. And I've had a few moments like that with coyotes. And I'm not, I guess with a, a birthday that's like, I'm a December the 13th, and I think 13 and coyote or, or I remember being like closely, you know, associated. So the, the need to be a little bit of a trickster, which fits along with a lot of things in my background, um, fits really with Zen. You know, I remember feeling like a lot of the things I was learning in Zen were very much about being tricky, you know, and about, um, it, things felt very much like clown training when I did red nose clown, um, which is, uh, not anything to do with circus clowns, but it's related. They have a similar um, genesis. But red nose clown is much more um, much more about getting it at naive authenticity. You know, that's that again, totally unfiltered, <laughs> um, totally like uh, completely authentic. Um, you know, nothing nothing hindering the the experience between nothing hindering the experience. So yeah, there was, there was a strong relationship there and the need to not conform, uh, the need to subvert, um, almost everything and just look at it from a completely different angle, not to drink the Kool-Aid anymore. Um, not wanting to just accept reality as it's been presented to me rather than as I have have begun to understand it and understand that it, even that changes all the time. Um, and my perception of it will change as well. Um, and so that name, you know, really held that for me. And it also, it also held the sort of, you know, a very rebellious, um, 
you know, aspect. And, you know, I, I could also say there's a card, there's a card, there's a card that I need. Oh, hang on. So in the Morgan Greer deck, um, which has one of my favorite Eight of Cups cards anywhere. I love this Eight of Cups. Um, you know, the, the notion of, um, of Zen Urban Coyote was also this, you know, leaving, I had to leave. I had to leave the Zen order that I had joined. Um, and that's a whole other story. It was heartbreaking. It was not anything I really ever intended or wanted to do. Um, the short, the short version of it is that the head of the order, <sighs> um, had asked me to be the, the temple priest and I was already in seminary and intending to do, you know, to go, go that route. That was where at that time was where I saw myself going, but in order to do it, he really wanted more control over me and over my choices and over, um, my autonomy and, you know, and so on that I was comfortable with. And, even then I was willing to contemplate it. You know, I was already contemplating a vow of poverty, you know, shaving my head, um, um, celibacy, which I'd already been practicing for quite a while. Um, and, and so on, but he wanted me to give up my dog. And that was that for me, that was the breaking point because I'd made this vow to my dog. And, you know, to be with him and take care of him, you know, he was a rescue animal. Um, he was an aspect of my need to love and nurture myself um, through nurturing and loving, you know, a being that needed, you know, that needed me. And, um, yeah, it was just not, it wasn't negotiable. Um, and nobody in the temple had any issues with me bringing my dog. <laughs> it was, and the head of the order didn't even live there. He was living in New York. So it was just about control. And then when he began gaslighting me, that was like, okay, I'm done here. This is it. I'm out. Um, it was horrible. And that was one of two Zen organizations that I eventually had to leave. Um, both of them had a coyote experience linked to them that preceded either immediately or right after that choice. Um, or like, not even that, I'm not, I'd have to really think about the timeline, but in each case, you know, that the coyote experience that I had, like with a literal coyote where I was out doing something in Chicago or St. you know, in St. Louis and saw a coyote and they're not out a lot. You don't, you know, they're not, they're not easy to go and see. So it was, it was very significant when they appeared. Anyway, all that to say, the name worked for a long time. Um, and then I've been through a lot of experiences in the time since that made me question whether to be involved, you know, to identify as a Zen Buddhist anymore or not. Um, and whether that's okay. Um, and whether or not I should keep the term um, reverend anymore, um, or whether I should get rid of that title. Um, and then when I started last summer with, with um, the Tibetan Buddhists, again, you know, that link or that tie that comes in between all of the different you know, practices that I've encountered was again Sanskrit. You know, the Tibetans, you know, are coming back to Sanskrit or looking at Sanskrit and then adapting it into, you know, back into Tibetan in a similar way um, that that I found happening with um, with the Koreans because I, I had studied Korean Zen. So as I started thinking, like, how do I want to put all of my work, you know, now that I've bizarrely, for me, it's bizarre, it's not bizarre for anyone else, I think, but 
in my life and my experience, it's kind of weird. And yet nobody in my life is shocked by it. Um, aside from me, interestingly, um, but that I would come back to tarot, you know, in the way that I have and suddenly recognize like, yes, this fits, you know, this fits with everything that I do and everything that I'm interested in. And when I started looking like, how do I take, you know, being an end of life doula, what links that with, um, with wanting to read tarot and working with art and so forth. And the answer to that is contemplation, meditation, um, and, you know, spiritual practice and stillness. And the root of that is the seed mantra, the bija, you know, that is the sound that comes from and emanates out and creates and builds, you know, through that simplicity and through that um, stillness and contemplative um, nature. So it is Sanskrit blue because when I think of things that are the truth, kind of like true blue, that comes to the comes to mind. And I realized as I was talking about this that the most obvious thing that is informing it <laughs> that you know you I don't always see because uh because I'm thinking, right? Because I'm um wrapped up in my thoughts like we all are, is that it's sound throat blue. You know, the sound that created the universe, the sound that creates and makes things come into being. Um, and the freedom and the spaciousness that comes from open, you know, openness and like the sky. It's blue. So, um, yeah. Yeah. So that's it. So Sanskrit Blue is the name of the channel, and it is also going to be the name of my Etsy store, although the Etsy store is literally going to be Sanskrit Blue Tarot, because it's specific to tarot. I do have another Etsy shop um, that I haven't done very much with in recent time, but I probably will come back to, and I it's, uh, it is Zen Urban Coyote. <laughs> I had to change it from Urban Zen Coyote to Zen Urban Coyote because I got a cease and desist from Donna Karen, of all people, saying, like, we have a, a line called Urban Zen, so you can't keep your name. And I thought, but Donna Karen isn't even a Zen practitioner. What the fuck is that about? So whatever. Um, I changed it, and nobody gave me any crap about it, and it is what it is. So it's now Zen Urban Coyote. Um, and... Uh, I'm back in an urban environment, and it's hilarious to me that after years away from an urban environment and keeping that name, I'm now in an urban environment, and I'm kind of going, I'm not sure that name really works anymore. Um, but I will probably keep everything that I have that says that anyway. Um, so, and probably just use it for artwork. But the Sanskrit Blue Tarot will just be tarot, and that will be on Etsy. Um, I do have a new email address, and it's sanskritblue at gmail.com. And I welcome anyone who wants to be in touch with me to use that address. Um, unless you've got my personal email address, in which case you're always free to use that if I've handed it out to you um, or reached out to you through that email. Um, yeah, and there will be a website at a point. There will be a Sanskrit Blue website. There is a website for my doula business that I'm not fully ready to announce yet um, because I'm still making edits to it and getting feedback from various people about it um, and about changes to it. But as soon as I've integrated some of the really important changes like um, email and phone number, <laughs> which are pretty important, um, you know, that'll be up and I'll make another, probably make another video with, with an announcement about that. So um, yeah, eventually, you know, eventually the Sanskrit Blue website will, you know, encompass all of the things that I do, you know, in one place under one umbrella um, and with pointers so that if you want to know more about um, end of life or you want to know more about my services as a doula, there will be a link where you can do that. 
Um, but it gives me the space on this channel as well to really explore fully. And um, where that's concerned, you know, in the same way that I had to go find a card, like to say, you know, it was this, I had to do this. <laughs> um, you know, I find that, that the more I, time I spend with tarot and the more I try to explain things to people, I'm always like, yeah, it was, you know, it was just such a five of cups moment, you know, or it was, it was, um, you know what I'm saying? Like I, I, I can't, that language has become part of, of, of the, the way that I think about the world. And I think it always was. I just didn't, I hadn't integrated it fully yet because I was still in the process of experiencing it, um, being on that literal archetypal journey, which is, in all honesty, at moments was so hideous. I don't even, you know, it's hard to even put into words in a way that's simple, but also beautiful and something I would not trade for anything uh, because of what it did to me and what it changed in me. Um, I wouldn't be here without it. So uh, there's all of that as well. There's all of that as well. So, um, yeah. So welcome. And I'm really excited to share this journey with everyone um, and to get to know all of you better um, and to just see what unfolds, just to see what unfolds. Life is too short and too lovely and too uh, precious not to do the things that you really love and to find a way, you know, to benefit others through that, you know, through that love, through that enthusiasm, um, and through through that shared connection of, of being human. So, all right. Until next time, everybody. Thank you.